he wants that same affection he wants that same first love he wants that same devotion he wants that same transparency and he wants you to remain holiness unto the lord every day and every moment at every crossroad and whatever you may be whatever may be happening holiness it was uh, israel was holiness unto the lord and the first fruits of his increase all that devour him shall offend evil shall come upon them says the lord in matthew chapter 24 reading from verse 10 matthew chapter 24 we're looking at verse 10 and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another in verse 11 it says and many false prophets shall rise and deceive many then in verse 12 it says and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold he does not want our love to wax cold he wants us to continue and he wants us to keep on loving him with all our heart with all our soul and with all our mind he does not want to use past tense for our salvation, for our sanctification, for our holiness, for our service, for our affection, for our intimacy unto Him. He wants it to be the ever present experience that the way we loved Him in the past, we still love Him like that today. But because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Then He says in verse 13, but He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. What a revelation that um, the joy of yesterday is not enough for today. The faithfulness of yesteryears, that's not enough for today. And the commitment and the consecration and the love of God of yesteryears is not enough for today. It's not an historical experience. 19 such and such, 20 such and such, I was born again present day expectation of the Lord is a present life in holiness and righteousness. I remember many years ago I was sanctified. That's not enough. It was a present testimony, a heart that is purified, a heart that is circumcised, a heart that is holy, totally yielded and submissive to him on the altar. I, I, I used to have a high standard, a high standard of living for God. That's not enough. He wants that high standard of the word of God to be maintained until now and until he comes. That's why he said that he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, in all the world, to the end of the world whatever is happening there's pandemic there's problem there's plague there's disease there's a poverty there's economy there's this and that whatever is happening this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations unto all nations unto all nations and then shall the end come it says we must increase in our reach we must increase in our touch we must increase in our penetrating our world with the gospel that this gospel of the kingdom must be preached shall be preached and you must you must search to know how you know there are people that will say all i'm doing this is all i know it that's not enough in the world today this all i know this what I have learned. Things are changing, and you must change. If you don't change, you become irrelevant. I remember what we were teaching in those days, I mean, 30 years ago, I mean, 40 years ago, and we're teaching the normal, normal teaching. We used to use the chalkboard, and we used to use our chalks and dust and everything. 
that thing doesn't work today in education. If you don't know computer today, if you don't know how to use the internet today, if you don't know how to send your lectures, your lesson you know, through internet today, if you do not know how to put your grades now on the media that those students will just, you know, they, they, they connect and they get their result, you are not relevant today. If you are the teacher of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and it is the old, old method, you will be out of service. The same thing with the gospel, as we have the gospel now, and Jesus himself said that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Now, the way um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, did it, if he wanted to send his uh, testimony all over the world, he'll write it down, he'll put a horse there, and then somebody will ride the horse and go to all those provinces. You cannot do that today. You use the media now. And those who are sitting back in our church and say, deeper life, what are we doing now? What do you want Jesus wants done. We're sending the gospel to all the world. Come on board and join us and whatever you can do, bring your time, bring your skill, bring your money, bring everything. This gospel shall be preached in all the world and many will come to the Lord in every nation through you, through me and through us together in Jesus' name. And somebody there will say, Amen. It will be done and you'll be part of it. I will be part of it. I will be part of it. The Lord bless the work of your hand for the salvation of souls in Jesus' name. And look at number two here. Number two here, the failing attitude of the graceful Galatians. Failing attitude. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now, the attitude of uh, the Galatians uh, was winning. It was declining. It was going down. He said, I remember the blessedness of your love, your affection for me at the beginning. But now, I told you the truth. Now, I told you that Christ Jesus is the only way. I told you he is the only Savior. I told you nobody can come to the Heavenly Father. Nobody can get to God. Nobody can get to heaven except by Christ and Christ alone that the law of Moses will not get you there. Turning over a new leaf will not get you there. Religious observances will not get you there. Self-righteousness will not get you there. That's the truth. And now the blessedness that I saw before that you could pluck out your eyes and give that to me. I can't see that anymore. It's like now you are withdrawing yourself from me. I can't even see you. And I can't even talk to you. Where are you? It says, am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Now, that's about Galatians and Paul the Apostle. Let's talk about ourselves. Do you am I becoming your enemy? Because I tell you that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Lord, that's the word of God. Am I becoming your enemy by saying that blessed are the pure in heart because only they shall see God? Am I becoming your enemy by telling you that if you are going to get to heaven, he gave himself for us that he might purify us from all sin and then he will so cleanse us and purchase to himself a peculiar people, zeal of good works. I might become you. And it because I tell you that if you are indolent, if you are idle, if you are not working for God, if you are just like that, and Jesus meets you when he comes like that, that you will be a person that will be poor 
all through eternity there will be no reward at all I might become your enemy because I tell you wake up and reconsecrate yourself again and recommit yourself again and everything you laid on the altar before that you have taken away from the altar bring it back to the altar and let your consecration be beyond what it was many years ago and with all your heart all your soul and all your mind you love the Lord without reservation without a rival and without anyone to compete with your love for God as the truth I told you that will make you acceptable to God that will make you keep in the love of God and like Paul the Apostle asked the Galatians I am I'm also asking you therefore I might become your enemy because I tell you the truth we will not be enemies will be in unity together in Jesus' name. As I'm pulling it up, you are joining and you are pulling it up with me in Jesus' name. As I'm running, as I'm declaring, as I'm persuading, as I'm saying that this is the will of God, even your sanctification, you will say yes to everything. You will say amen to everything. Your heart will be aligned to everything in Jesus' name. Uh, look at uh, First Kings uh, chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 20. First Kings chapter 21, reading from verse 20. And Ahab said to Elijah, As thou find, found me, O mine enemy. Now, those Galatians who are now acting and talking and behaving like Ahab. Ahab saw Elijah and he said, As thou found me, O mine enemy. Now, Ahab, why did you say that? How could you say that? Elijah was a prophet of God and he was sent of God to declare the word to the nation and he wanted to bring the nation back to God. How could such a person be an enemy to you? He said, he answered, I have found thee. He didn't argue. Elijah did not say, am I your enemy? He wasn't afraid. Am I your enemy? He wasn't feeling lonely. You are the most important number one in our nation. And then you count me as your enemy. How could you say that? Elijah said, yes, I have found you. Because thou hast sold thyself unto work evil in the sight of the Lord. I pray that the people God is using to touch our lives, to transform our lives, and to get us ready for the coming of the Lord will not count them as enemies in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three here, the fervent admonitions not for their good. In Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse 17, the zealously affect you. The Judaizers, the people that promoted circumcision, and the people that spoke about uh, the law. Moses, they were very, very zealous. They'll cross land, they'll cross the sea, they will use any means to bring their error and their falsehood unto the people. They zealously affect you but not well. It's not for your good. They will cut you away from the Savior. They will cut you away from the sanctifier. They will cut you away from the power that you need in your life. They will cut you away from concentrating on the way that leads to heaven and it will be like, you know, they take the precious thing, the gift and the grace and the goodness of God away from your hand and yet they do it lovingly lovingly if, they, if somebody loves you and is going to take salvation from you is going to take holiness from you he loves you always interacting with you he wants to bring you down from the top where you are when you identified with Christ and you are seated in heavenly places with Christ he wants you to bring he wants to bring you to the low level of the law of Moses and yet he's doing it zealously affectionately with smile with laughter 
character and with good attitude, but that's not for your good. We need to understand uh, the difference between Paul the Apostle and all those deceivers that were going to throw them down from the tower where they were. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they will exclude you. They will exclude you with their smile. They exclude you from the salvation coming from Calvary with their smile and with their affection. They'll exclude you from the sin that Christ has purchased for us on the cross of Calvary with their smile, with their affection. They will exclude you from heaven. That's the important thing to consider. They will exclude you that ye might affect them. All they want is for you to please them for you to make them happy at the expense of your losing heaven. Make them happy at the expense of your being caught away from Christ. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, but it is good to be zealously affected, always in a good thing. If you're going to affect anyone, make it for their good. What have I contributed to their lives? How have I lifted them up? How have I lifted them up? What zeal have I given them? What commitment have I given them? If you're going to be friends with anyone, you must ask yourself, what's he adding to my life? What's she adding to my life? How is she helping me? How is he making me to come nearer and nearer and nearer to Christ? It is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you. Uh, let us look at uh, Romans chapter 10, uh, reading from verse 2. Romans chapter 10, uh, we're looking at verse 2, for I bear them record that they have the zeal of God but not according to knowledge. They have the zeal of God for the law, for Moses, for circumcision, for self-righteousness, for rituals, for animal sacrifice. They have a great zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. The Christ had died. Did he factor the death of Christ to their zeal? Christ has provided salvation. They didn't factor the, the, the provision of Christ's salvation into their religion. They're still zealous, as zealous as in Leviticus, as zealous as in Deuteronomy, but they overlook Calvary and they overlook salvation, and they overlook the Savior, and they overlook what God himself has said. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him, and any soul that will not hear him will be cut off from the people. That was their problem. The Lord does not want us to have zeal without knowledge, zeal without truth, zeal without the gospel, zeal without salvation, zeal without the provision of Christ from Calvary. And I pray our zeal will go along with the word of God in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, traveling ambassadors refocused on awakening to his grace. We're coming to uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. What does that mean? It's uh, giving us a picture of Christ standing at the door of their heart and knocking. That if anyone opens the door, I will come in unto him, I will dwell there, I will abide there, I will sup with him, and fellowship with him. Now, he's using the picture that Christ was on the inside of them. But Christ had become powerless, impotent, like baby Christ. And it's not like a transforming Christ, a teaching Christ, an effective Christ, a mighty Christ, 
a powerful Christ inside them. And he says, now I travel. Now I persuade. Now I call you. Now I pray until Christ becomes fully formed in you, mighty in you, powerful in you, that Christ will be what he is now with all his qualities and attributes and he will live big in you once again, the Christ of truth, the Christ of knowledge, the Christ of power, the Christ of revelation, the Christ of vision, the Christ of mighty enablement. I'm praying, I'm traveling until Christ be fully formed in you now. Three things we're looking at. Number one, traveling until followers be fully persuaded. Number two, teaching until faith be firmly perfected. Number three, toiling until the faithful be finally preserved. Look at number one. Number one, traveling until the followers be fully persuaded so that they are no more up and down, in and out, sound and unsound, knowledgeable and ignorant. He wanted them to come to a level they are fully persuaded and nothing will change them again when Galatians chapter 4 verse 19 my little children of whom I travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you and then in verse 20 it says I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in which to deceive. Then in verse 15, it says, But speaking the truth in love, ye may grow up. That's what he wanted for the Galatians. That's what God wants for us, that ye may grow up in all things in doctrine grow up in doctrine in deeds grow up in deeds in the demonstration of your understanding and your partaking of the gospel grow up in all things in love in devotion to god in consecration to god grow up in all things in the service of god in reaching out further to the people beyond your culture that will grow up in all things which is the hedge even christ we will grow up every one of us by the grace of god in the knowledge of the lord will grow up in jesus name Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 8. Hebrews 13 verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, be not carried about for divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. The grace of salvation the grace of sanctification, the grace of for steadfastness. It is a good thing that the heart be established with grace and not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We're coming to number two here. Number two here, teaching until our faith be firmly perfected. Teaching until our faith be firmly perfected. Hey, look at um, First Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 10. Night and 
day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. That was the desire of Paul the Apostle, that anywhere he went, to any fellowship, assembly, congregation he went, he wanted to see their face that he might perfect that which was lacking in their faith. Look at verse 13 there. In verse 13 there to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 28. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 28, when we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That we may perfect, present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, in verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his walking, which walketh in me mightily. I pray that it will walk also in you mightily in Jesus' name. Number three here, we're toiling until the faithful be finally preserved. Toiling and walking until the faithful be finally preserved. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, that she may approve things that are excellent, that she may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Amen. We don't know Christ will come. But every day and every moment, we so live our lives in the grace of God that we are sincere and without offense, offense towards God, offense toward man, when without offense till the day of Christ. In verse 11, verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. I pray you stand firm, you stay committed, and you stay stable and steadfast until the very end in Jesus' name. If that's going to happen, Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. Revelation chapter 2, we're looking at verse 25. But that which ye have already, that which ye have already, Christ knows we have something already. The angels know we have something already. Paul the apostle knew that the Galatians had something already, but the Judaizers were trying to take that out of their hands. I have something. You have salvation, you have something. You have sanctification, you have something. You have the service of God in your hand, you have something. You have the love for God, you have something. Uh, that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. Who is going to hold fast? Steadfast until the end. Where are you? Hold fast until he comes. And the grace of God abide in your life in Jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer that good thing that we have uh, the salvation the experience the power the glory the godliness the presence of God every good thing we have uh, hold fast until it comes when I on earth their plan is for the earth 
the disposition is for the earth their aspiration is for the earth and their goal is getting more of the dust of the earth but the people who are getting ready for the rapture like Enoch like Elijah like the Paul the apostle getting ready knowing that it could happen at his own time our conversation our focus our desire our expectation our manner of life and everything we intend to do everything we plan what is uppermost in our project that we're pursuing every day our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the savior the lord jesus christ in verse 21 who shall change our vile body that's the rapture he will change our corruptible body he will change our body that is weighed down that is dragged down that will be pulled down by the force of gravity the lord himself as he comes from heaven he will change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body you see that that's the rapture it will refashion us it will remodel us it will put something in us that will make us look like his glorious body not his body when he was on earth when he was on earth he had a body that could be thirsty and he, he told that woman at the well give me water that's the earthly body and then the people knew that was hungry and the disciples went to buy bread and they were pleading with him each master and he said i've got food to eat that you know not has anybody come to give him food to eat that's the earthly body but now the glorious body it says that our body now may be fashioned like unto his glorious body that's the body he took to heaven and the force of gravity could not bring him down you will be like that i said you'll be like that i can just imagine us going up and i look that way and i say that brother so and so and i look that way and i say that sister so and so we shall all take part in jesus name according to his working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself able to subdue all things unto himself ezekiel chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 25 ezekiel chapter 12 reading from verse 25 it says for i am the lord i will speak and the word that i shall speak shall come to pass any amen from the church amen. the word that i shall speak shall come to pass and it shall be no more postponed delayed or prolonged look at this look at this for in your days O rebellious house will i say the word and will perform it says the lord you know there are people who think that they can delay whatever god wants to do they say if they don't pay attention to god they say if they don't obey god they say if they remain rebellious against the lord then God will be forced to delay the rapture. Hold on. He said the flood was coming. And Noah declared the flood was coming. But you know what? The people did not listen. That rebellion of the people did not change the time of the flood. It happened. The angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angels announced that fire will come and burn up Sodom and Gomorrah. The people of Sodom thought it was an idle tale. They thought it was all deception. And they were still continuing in their violence. That rebellion, 
that continuation in their violence did not stop what God wanted to do. The Lord is saying, I'm speaking the word in your own days that the rapture is going to take place. And he says, in your days, I will do this, O rebellious house, I will say the word and will perform it, says the Lord God is the unstoppable performance of the saints rapture look at verse 28 in verse 28 therefore say unto them thus says the lord god there shall none of my words be prolonged anymore did he say the dead shall rise it will happen did he say christ will come it will happen did he say the rapture is going to take place? It will happen because there shall none of my words be prolonged anymore. But the word which I have spoken shall be done, says the Lord God. It will happen. And when it happens, you'll be a partaker in Jesus' name. What do we do? How do we get prepared so that you will not miss that day? Point number two now, our preparation for the saints rapture with the government church. The government church. What does that mean? I told you already, the church that accepts that Christ is the head. Not only in word, but in reality. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 23. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. You understand that? The head is the savior of the body. The head gives instruction to the uh, hand when you are thirsty that you should go for a glass of water. The head gives that instruction and the hand takes that glass of water and drinks. And then you are hungry. The head gives instruction to the hands and to the feet, walk, move, get up, and go to the place where the food is, and the legs and the feet and the hands, you obey that, and you feed yourself. The head is the savior of the body. You are walking, and you see a vehicle coming, and the head gives instruction, stop. Don't move again. And you obey the instruction of the head. The head is the savior of the body. Prevents danger and prevents death. Christ is the head of the church. And Christ gives instruction to all the members of the body of the church. And preserves the church and prevents the church from danger and from spiritual death and from degradation and defilement and pollution. Christ is the head of the church and Christ is the savior of the body. And as the body is governed by Christ, it's that government of Christ in the church, on the church, that preserves the church for the time of his coming. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. The church and the membership of the church must be subject to Christ in everything. That's how we we'll say the church is a governed church, a governable church, a church that is under the directives and the control 
and the doctrine of Christ. Now, what preparation do we make as members of the government church to be ready for the time of the rapture? Number one, abiding faith with purity of heart. Abiding faith with purity of heart. Number two, abounding love from a purified heart. Abounding love from a purified heart. Number three, assuring hope of a patient, persevering heart. Faith, love, and hope. Number one is abiding faith with purity of heart. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Before his translation, before his rapture, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6, it says, But without faith, it's impossible to please God. And the people who are going to go in the rapture will be the people that live by faith to please God. You have faith, you get salvation. You have faith, you get sanctified. You have grace, you get the grace of God. You, get, you have grace, you have the righteousness by faith. You have faith, you walk by faith. And it is that faith that encompasses your life. It is that faith that saturates your life. It is that faith that moderates your life. It is that faith that is uh, the foundation of everything you do in your life. That's what gets you ready for the rapture. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We're looking at Acts chapter 15 verse 9. Acts chapter 15 verse 9 and put no difference between us and them. What's that? He put no difference between us apostles, this Peter talking, and them, the Gentiles, those who just came into the kingdom. And he put no difference between the first century believers and the last century believers who are going to be there at the time of the coming of Christ. The same salvation that those early people had is the same salvation that we have today. He put no difference. The same sentiment surrender those early believers by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. That's the great work of faith in everyone's life. What's the result of that? Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. No different is there. It's talking about the same faith that Jesus Christ had. What kind of faith is that? Jesus believed that everything his heavenly father said is true and is abiding and nothing can contradict it and scripture cannot be broken. We live by the same faith of the son of God that Jesus Christ had the same faith that believes that the totality of the word of God is unbreakable, is given by God, and because of that, it's infallible. We're living by the faith of the Son of God, that the Father who, is, uh, who sent me is always with me. That's the faith of the Son of God. 
that you believe anywhere you are everywhere you find yourself the lord who has sent you to this world is with you and it's a faithful god anything that happened anything that is happening the lord has allowed that and all things work together for good to them who are the called of god to them who love the lord and then everything happens according to its divine purpose in your life that's why now if you are getting ready for the rapture that's the kind of faith that must abide in you i live by the faith of the son of god who loved me in particular it's wonderful to say he loves us and there are people who say that he loves us and they're not sure that he loves them individually they are asking the question but why they're asking the question but how they're asking the question why me they're asking the question they doubt the love of god the people who are getting ready for the rapture they are the people that believe that god loves me and gave himself for me whether other people believe it or not you know that christ gave himself for you and i pray that faith will abide in our hearts until the end in jesus name number two is the abounding love form a purified heart abounding in love a kind of love that is not um, a kind of small and limited and confined you know there are people that say i love but you know you can't see the love there are a lot of pills over that love because of the things happening to me you have to peel off all those layers of the onion because the love is a small seed inside that onion and you have to peel it and while you're peeling all those things of the onion is affecting irritating your eyes and you are crying but keep on peeling you will see that i have love and the love is a small dot inside those layers of onion not that kind of love the love that is excited exuberant and the love that is full and the love that is abounding in her, and the love that is flowing you love the lord with all your heart all your soul and all your mind and you love your brother you love your sister as christ has loved you and you love your neighbor as yourself that's the kind of love you love and there's no complaint in love there's no murmuring in love there is no fear in love there is nothing negative in love you just love somebody does something you know, that's a mistake he didn't mean to do that it's wiser than that you are able to put a better construction a good construction on whatever anybody does you are not negative and you are not criticizing and you're not murmuring you have love a kind of love that will not nothing will push you back you know he said that about me he's done that to me and because of that my love is shy and my love has gone inside uh, the room and my love is so shy will not come out because of what he said about me your love is abounding and everybody can see that love and I pray that love is not there yet this morning that love will penetrate every heart in Jesus name give me a church deep and life amen i want you to look at first peter chapter one first peter chapter one and we're looking at verse 22 first peter chapter one we're looking at verse 22 seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love on hypocritical love on pretending love on to unfeigned love of the brethren see that ye love one another with a pure heart tell me the final word there fervently that will be your love in jesus name 
running over, running over. Your love will run over. Reaching everywhere and touching everywhere and turning darkness to light. Your love will turn darkness in every light, will turn that to a light in Jesus' name. Your love will lift up somebody, will encourage somebody, will make somebody move forward, make, will make somebody wanting to labor and they will live excited life and profitable life purposeful life through your love in Jesus name that's the kind of love that we're talking about that the Lord is talking about you wake up in the day and you live in the day you've done this you've done this you've done that I've not expressed love to anybody today I've not shared love with anybody today I've not imparted love to anybody today I've not encouraged anybody today I've not lifted up somebody today I have not given money to anybody today I've not fed anybody today I've not given a cup of cold water to somebody today I'm looking for somebody I must be a blessing to somebody today and you are active about that and you are proactive in every situation that's the kind of love the Lord is expecting that we will have this abounding love you will have it in Jesus name we come to number three there and number three is the assuring hope of a patient persevering heart an assuring hope of a patient persevering heart we're looking at titus chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 13 titus chapter 2 we're reading from verse 13 looking for that blessed hope looking for that blessed hope you see there are people they come to church and whatever they hear in the church they drop on the seat while they're living and they go out and after the service their life is exactly like they were living before they came to the service the same hopelessness the same helplessness the same despair the same despondency and the same complaint and the same sorrow and the same kind of degradation degenerate behavior they still go to pro uh, to process and to live after the service everything they heard about the rapture about the prophecy about the proclamation about the promise of the rapture and about the sure performance of the rapture they forget all about that they drop that in the church they are not looking for that blessed hope but you see the people who are going to be raptured because they are rapturable they are people that are looking they are looking for that blessed hope they still have that subject in their heart in their mind and it influences all their action it influences everything they say everything they do because they say he may come today glad day glad day i, I may see my lord today glad day glad day and then because of that because of what they're looking at and what they're looking for everything in their lives is with the bright hope i pray you'll be like that i said i pray you'll be like that looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the rapture right there. And then it says in verse 14, in verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, they're not zealous of bad works. They're not zealous of evil works. They're not zealous of destructive works. They're not zealous of scattering works. They're zealous of good works. What good can I do today? 
What good will I be doing when Christ shall come? And what do I want him to see in my hand? Where do I want him to meet me when he comes? And they're zealously, they're passionately, they're positively, they're practically looking for opportunity to do good works. They'll be ready. You will be ready in Jesus' name. I said you will be ready in Jesus name Look at that first John he gave First John chapter 3 And we're reading from verse 1 It says in First John chapter 3 verse 1 Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon you The Father God in heaven he has all those myriads, uncountable number of angels in heaven. And he says all the same, although I'm in the fellowship, I'm in the midst of the elders, I'm in the midst of the angels, I'm in the midst of those living creatures, and they are crying, holy, holy, holy unto God Almighty day and night, and they rest not day nor night, and they are worshiping me. I still want so and so. I still want such and such to come and be with me. What great love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Look at verse 2 once again. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God? When are you going to be sons of God? Those who delay, saying, I will repent, but not yet. I don't want to do that now. I'm still thinking about this, and about this, and about that. I will come, I will come. I will give myself to the Lord. I'm going to be surprised. I'll be a son of God. I'll be a daughter of God. I will run faster than all those people who are there. But not now, not now. I'm still considering this and waiting for this and waiting for this and waiting for that. Before you are ready, God is not going to work according to your timetable. I'll get saved later. I'll be restored later. I'll be sanctified later. I'm bitter now. I can't forgive that person. I have to revenge. I have to retaliate. When I finish what I want to do with them, when I deal with them, after dealing with them, then when I cool down and when my mind is now settled, I will come. I will be a child of God, a son, a daughter of God. You think God is going to abandon his own timetable? and delay the rapture for you and walk according to your timetable what do you think so and so says it's not ready yet such and such said it's not ready yet a thousand people they have different timetables and they're walking according to their timetable how many timetables will god walk ways he walks with only one timetable and that is the timetable of heaven he is coming and at the appointed time, Christ will come. You tear away your own timetable. I tear off my own timetable. Throw that in the dustbin. Better still throw that into the fire. And then I say, Lord, I'm looking, I'm waiting only for the timetable of God. He says, now are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him. Somebody there, I shall be like him. Somebody there, I will be like him. For I will see him as he is. You'll be ready in Jesus' name. Nothing will take your name out of the people that are ready waiting for the Lord in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now, and that is the purpose of the saints' rapture. 
of the glorious church. Understand? Godly church, government church, glorious church. You see, there are many kinds of churches. And there are nominal churches. There are even political churches. There are earthly churches. There are historic churches. There are liturgical churches. There are other kinds of churches. They don't even believe the Bible, but they are church. But the Lord is not coming for all the general churches that are there. He's coming for the glorious church. Look at it, Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 25. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, talking about the kind of church is coming for husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. With the washing of water by the word. Uh, you, you understand? The word of God acts like water. And every time you come, it has to scroll.